Hey everybody, this is Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner, and today I'm going to be reviewing the Monoprice Monolith Encore series of speakers. That includes the tower, which by the way is not actually this tall, I just got it propped up on something. Tower is about 400 bucks for one, now these are today's prices. Bookshelf speaker, which is about $160 for one, and then the center channel, which is about $230 for one. At these prices, these are kind of in that budget to mid-budget category. That's kind of where I would personally fit them. And in terms of overall sound quality, to me, that's kind of where they are. They don't do a lot of things that are wonderful, but they don't really do much that's bad either. And I honestly feel like this is the kind of speaker that really strikes the balance in terms of sound quality, but in terms of aesthetics as well. Because if you look, you'll see there's some gloss going on here. Now, each of these speakers has a top and bottom, or for the center channel, it's the sides, where there is a gloss finish layer, and then the rest of it is wrapped in like a black ash kind of vinyl covering. And matter of fact, let me show you what I'm talking about. So this is the bookshelf speaker. I gutted this thing, because I was curious, you know, what's on the inside, so we'll talk about that in a second. But you can see that, yeah, there's a lot of batting in here. And then on the top is where you've got the gloss finish. It's just a really, in my opinion, it's just a really nice looking speaker. I'll flip it around to the back and you've got your, well, <laughs> that's where the terminals would be. I forgot. I took it out. <laughs> Jeez. I've been doing this stuff for too long now. I, I forget stuff all the time. I also do want to note too that you probably cannot see it, but there is a brace inside of here. And so that helps to brace up the enclosure. Now these speakers incorporate a midwoofer, which that's what this is, a midwoofer, and then a tweeter with a waveguide. Hey, that's pretty cool, huh? Really good performance, in my opinion, for the price that these are at. But would I compare them to like the Monoprice THX lineup? I think the Monoprice THX lineup is better, which dang well it should be because it's more costly, right? But I do think the the THX lineup for Monoprice is a better alternative. But I do also have to say that at these prices, and, and I gave this some thought, at these prices, I think these are probably the best speakers overall. Now, I'm sure that if I go digging, I could find speakers with better measurements, but I don't think that I've come across any that have better measurements and a better overall aesthetic. So that's what you're paying for here. I wanna make that abundantly clear that what I'm not talking about overall is sound quality, but I'm talking about good sound quality, really good looks for a great bargain price. And if that's what you're looking for, then these are your speakers. Now, if you're gonna be listening to these in a home theater, these do take pretty darn well to EQ. There are some things about these speakers that I did not like. For example, the bookshelf speaker, strong resonance. And it was around, I can't remember now, I wanna say like around 250 hertz, but we'll see this in the data in a little bit. And it drove me insane. So I busted out my mini DSP, I dropped a little bit of EQ on there, brought that down, all was well. Now there's some slight resonance in the tower speaker, but I think it's pushed up a little bit higher in frequency and it's lower in amplitude, that it didn't stand out to me. Now having said that, overall, I kind of personally like the sound of the bookshelf more. The, the tower speaker, gives you a little bit more low end, but even with the resonance, there's still something I just preferred more about the bookshelf. Now, if I did like a blind ABX test, I can't tell you that I would wind up picking the bookshelf over the tower, but that's just kind of what my subjective sighted listening test led me to believe. And I do also need to mention before I forget that these speakers were sent to me by Monoprice directly for review, and it's taken me a long time to get around to it because I initially reviewed the bookshelf and this is cool, and this is why I'm telling you guys this, because I think it's a good thing. The data showed that there were some irregularities in the high frequency area, and it turned out to be a waveguide thing. Hobie from Monoprice contacted me, and he said, hey, turns out there's an issue here. We've got it resolved. Can we send you the replacement waveguides, and you replace them? So that's what they did. That's exactly what this one is. It's an updated waveguide. Now, all the speakers that they're selling now, and I think they've even retroed it, uh, should have the updated waveguide, but I think you should know that rather than me kind of glossing over because what that means is not just that they're putting out a product and hoping for the best, but 
that they're putting out a product and when something doesn't job with what they expected, they're taking care of it. Okay, what I'm doing is I'm looking at my phone because as I was listening to the speakers in my home theater room, I was taking notes on my phone. So I'm gonna read you a couple of the highlights that I took and then we're gonna switch over to the data and we're gonna spend a little bit more time going over that because if I'm being honest, it's been probably two months since I've listened to these speakers and it's just not fresh in my brain and I don't want to rely on false memory. All right, bookshelf, a slight edge in the mid frequency, high frequency, two to four K, uh, good output, peaking in 300 to 400 resonance on vent skills. So I'm gonna check that. We're gonna see if that's where the resonance was. I was thinking it was a little bit lower, but maybe that's where it is, I don't know. Uh, not as 3D as I'd like. And when I say 3D, I mean 3D soundstage. And for whatever reason, there just wasn't as 3D as I like, which depth of layering. Now I've been, Blessed, I guess, is the right word to have listened to some really great 3D sounding speakers. And most recently was the Kef Reference One Meta. I'll drop a card up there if I remember. But that speaker is $9,000 per pair. You could buy like four or five of, no, more than that, six or seven maybe of these sets. I'm not good at maths, but something like that for just one set of those Kef. So that's stratospheric level. And that's outside of my means. But I think that's important for you to also be aware of that in terms of soundstage, if you're a soundstage junkie, then these may not do it for you. But if you're not necessarily a soundstage junkie, then disregard. Sibilant, but I said sibilant only on tracks that were heavy in the five to 8K region. Good overall speaker with few problems. At its price, I really had no problem recommending it though. Uh, the tower speakers, perfect height at ear level, which is cool. I've tested a lot of speakers that the main listening axis or the design listening axis, for example, the tweeter might be too high or too low for typical seating. So the tweeter was dead on at my ear level in my home theater movie chairs. No resonance like found in the bookshelf. And I did find a little bit of a resonance, but it was like, it wasn't nearly as noticeable as it was in the bookshelf. And then for the center channel, what was interesting is if you turn the center channel up on its side, it is a fantastic speaker. And even when it's laying flat, and you probably know my issues with horizontal center channels, MTM designs, because there's a, there's a strong cancellation in the off axis response. So for those people who are sitting off to the side in a movie room, you're not gonna hear the same thing that the primary listener hears, especially in the mid range vocal dialogue area, because it's a cancellation from these two woofers basically crossing each other out. Now I've got a whole video on that, and I'll try to link it up there if I can. I really encourage you to watch it. But when you're watching a movie, especially if you're just by yourself, those issues aren't as strong. Now the overall tonal balance of these speakers, I think varied might be a good way to put it. Um, the tower speaker has a bit of a bass bump with a scoop in the mid range area. Now that's something that again, you can equalize out. But if you are trying to buy something for a budget audio file type speaker, then if I'm being honest, I don't think that I would recommend these. I don't know what I would recommend in place of them, but I don't think that I would recommend these because these really do need EQ. Now here's the thing about EQ. If you have a speaker that can take well to EQ and you're listening to these in a movie room environment, then you've most likely got mini DSP, uh, Odyssey, YPAL, or any of the other varied uh, in-room correction filters, algorithms that will allow you to equalize a speaker to a desired response. Now, some speakers just don't take well to that, but these speakers do pretty well with that in mind. So I will say that for home theater purposes, I think these are perfectly fine to recommend, especially in that budget region. Let's switch over to the data. Maybe it'll kick my brain into gear and help me remember some of this stuff. I'm not gonna spend as much time as I normally do going through the data. All of this data will be on my website, but since I'm reviewing three separate speakers here, the tower, the bookshelf, and the center channel, I'm gonna try to hit just the highlights of the spin data and the compression distortion data, and then we're gonna go on. Uh, but I do encourage you to go and check out the data at a later time if you can and that will help you fill in the gaps. Now, all this data is collected using my Clipl Near Field Scanner, a state-of-the-art robotic machine that allows me to get anechoic response data from a non-anechoic environment, such as my garage, as you see in this video. And the reason that's helpful is because it helps us characterize the performance of the speaker before it goes into the room. Because if there's a problem with the speaker, 
then you may not be able to fix it once it goes into the room. The room may actually make it worse, causing you all sorts of headaches, trying to fix a problem that you just can't fix. We're gonna start with the bookshelf speaker. This is the CEA 2034 data. And as you can see, the response is not quite linear. There is a mild recess through the mid range. This one's not really that big of a deal. There's a dip right around here, which I assume is probably the crossover region between the midwoofer and the tweeter. A bit of a bump through here, a strong cancellation here. So this is probably a diffraction due for the, the symmetry between the waveguide and the tweeter. That's my guess. Um, or it could be between the tweeter and the edge of the cabinet, but I think it's probably between the waveguide itself. Now I will say that the earlier round of measurements that I conducted looked worse than this, and I don't have them on hand to compare, but just take my take my word for it that it did look worse. They did clean it up and they fixed it with this latest waveguide upgrade. For kicks though, what I did was I took this data, I applied EQ to the speaker, and then I remeasured it. So here's that. And you can see the on-axis response is much more neutral through here. Now you still have the directivity mismatches going on. And again, I think this is due to the tweeter to waveguide. And we'll see what shakes out in the horizontal and the vertical responses. So let's go check that out real fast. Now this is the horizontal response and you can see that you've got a window of radiation about maybe 50 degrees to 60 degrees, depending on where you're looking at. Now there's this dip that we saw here already. And then if we go to the vertical radiation, then yeah, you have a strong null right through the mid range to tweeter area, which basically this is telling me sit at tweeter level or above tweeter level, but do not sit anywhere below the tweeter level any more than 10 degrees or so. Now, if we look at the impedance, we can see that we have a minimum impedance of about 3.4 ohm. And then there is this resonance around 300 Hertz. I said earlier that I heard a resonance around 300 to 400. And that's where it shows up is right here in this impedance. Now, if we look at distortion, 86 dB uh, looks okay. It's not great, but I think it looks pretty good. Uh, below 3% down to, wow, well, all the way down to 30 Hertz. Then if you go to 96 dB, you are below 3% down to about 90 Hertz, and then you increase above that. So good distortion, not the greatest, but certainly not terrible either. Now we look at compression linearity. And we can see that the speaker is about plus or minus a half a dB at 76 to 96, so represented by this blue line. And then if you go higher than that, then you start to increase beyond those limits that I've just stated to about uh, negative two dB of compression down here. So use a subwoofer right there, of course. This compression data combined with the distortion data really simply tells you the story that you expect of a bookshelf speaker, which is, use a subwoofer and you will save yourself some distortion and compression on the low end. The overall sensitivity of this speaker measures at about 85.3 dB with plus or minus about 3.7 and plus 2.69 as we can see from up here. And the F3 is at about 68 Hertz. So again, use a subwoofer. Now we're gonna look at the center channel and the center channel actually looks pretty darn good, all things considered, namely in the early reflections directivity index. There's a lot of EQ ability for this center channel speaker, which honestly, I'm surprised at. So then I, I did that. I said, what happens if I take my mini DSP, plug it in the loop, apply some EQ based on this data and run it again. And that's what you have here. Very, very smooth response. Now I will show what EQ settings I used for the mini DSP in my written review. This is the estimated in-room response of the speaker. Now you can see that there is a boost in the higher frequencies. But if you go and take that equalization, then this is what you get. And it's really surprising that you're able to EQ the speaker this well. Honestly, the more I think about this, the more I think it makes a lot of sense to buy two of the center channels, use those as left and right bookshelf speakers, stand them up vertically, and then use some EQ from the mini DSP. And you might have you some a pretty killer setup for not a whole, whole lot of money, relatively speaking. Now this, gives you an idea of the estimated in-room response at various angles. So black is directly on axis with the tweeter, and then red, green, and blue are further and further off axis. And the reason I did this is because I wanna see what the mid-range response is doing as you go off axis compared to the on axis response. And in other words, if you have 
seating positions to the side of the main listening position in your home theater, it's usually going to be anywhere from 10 to 30 degrees, depending on how far away you are from that center channel. I think on average, most people are probably around 20 degrees, you know, give or take. And you can see from this data, you're at about three to four dB at the extremes. And at 10 degrees, you're pretty much the exact same. And at 20 degrees, you're about two maybe dB or so. So actually this speaker looks pretty good in terms of its horizontal response. And it's actually better than I thought it was going to be, if I'm being honest. This is the on-axis linearity response, and we can see that, yeah, about 86.3 dB is the average sensitivity. Uh, plus or minus isn't great, but with that equalization taken into account, things smooth out. We already saw that. F3 is at 76 hertz by subwoofer. And then here is the horizontal polar. So this is where you talk about what's the sound like as you go further and further off axis. And we can see that through the mid-range well, you really have to be about, what, beyond 30 degrees for it to really start taking over. Uh, I would say within 20 degrees, you're okay, and I think that's what that other data set just showed us as well. Distortion at 86 dB, and then at 96 dB. And then this is the compression. Now we're gonna look at the tower speaker. You do have some peakiness in the 90, 100 hertz area, and this is actually real. So what I did was I actually took the speaker outside and measured the ground plane standing up and laying on its side. Laying on its side actually will show a more extended bass response, but you don't listen to tower speakers laying on their side. There are not as many woofers coupled to the floor when you, when you stand the speaker up, right? So that's why you get more bass laying a speaker on its side on the floor in a ground plane measure. But with anechoic measurement, with the speaker standing upright as it should be, this is what you could expect to have for the anechoic response. But in a room, let's go take a look at that. This is what you have. So you have that peakiness, you have a fall off in the mid range through here, and then you have another shelved up high frequency response area. Can you EQ this? That's the real question. This other stuff, I'm pretty sure I can EQ, but can you EQ that? Because that's the problem area for me that stands out. It's hot, it's about, about three to five dB hotter in level than the mid range at some point. So let's go see. We're gonna look at that three to what? Eight, something like that kilohertz area. And this actually looks reasonable. It looks okay to EQ it. And why do I say that? Well, the horizontal directivity index based on the early reflections gives us indication that this is pretty smooth through here. It's not perfect, but it's pretty smooth and that it would take well to equalization. And I did prove that out in my own listening. I knocked this area down and it made the sound a lot better. So in terms of output, this is 86 dB. You're below 1% THD all the way down to about 80 Hertz and you bump up a little bit above it there. Then at 96 dB, you're still around 1% THD, give or take until about 80 Hertz. And then you're bumping up into this 3% 3 3 excuse me, area where you uh, you certainly start to increase in bass distortion. Are you gonna hear it? I don't know, probably not as big of a deal. I'm more concerned with what the compression is showing us and the limits of the speaker, so let's see that. On the low end, no real compression issues, but man, look at this weirdness going on right here. So there's certainly something going on in that crossover region, very similar to the same things that I saw with the THX lineup of speakers. I don't know that you are going to hear these issues, but it's something in my data that I like to provide because it gives us an idea of maybe the limitations of a speaker and its dynamic range. And that does it for this review. I appreciate you hanging around and watching this, and I hope you learned something. Again, I want to stress that this is a speaker that in my opinion, you would buy because of a mixture of looks and sound quality. And this is the first time that I think I've seen a speaker that, that strikes such a middle ground. Usually when I test a speaker, the performance isn't great, but it looks like a really fantastic speaker or the other way around where it looks ugly, but the performance is really good. And then you factor in the budget area. And that's really what kind of drives budget speakers. You know, it's, it's gonna have one or the other, but not both. And I really think this speaker does a good job of kind of mitigating both in that budget arena. I'm not gonna say that it's for everybody, I know some reviewers have more positive things to say about the speaker than I do, but I think if you're on a budget and you're a friend of mine and you're saying, hey, Aaron, I've got this much money, I wanna get a full home theater setup system and I'm gonna be using equalization, no problem recommending this speaker. And with that said, I am out. I hope you all have a good one. Take care, peace.